this is Chala Dinkoy, CEO and founder of The Repositioning Expert. Welcome to another edition of my podcast called Polish My Pitch Deep Dive. We are here today with Wendy Covey. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you. Happy to be here. So tell us what you do and who you help. Okay. Well, I'm the CEO and co-founder of True Marketing, and we are an agency that focuses in content marketing for very technical companies. So most of which of these are in the engineering space, some are outside of engineering, but they all share the common need of reaching a technical buyer. Wow. So, I mean, I don't know if this is bad to say, but you do not look like a technical person at all. <laughs> well, I, I will say uh, my degree is in journalism, not in engineering, but I have spent my whole career working with this uh, interesting and challenging group. Like how? How did that come about? Uh, well, you know, when I was in college, I, um, I was big into volunteering for student organizations. And one of the things that I did was stage what we would consider in industry terms, a trade show, but it was a trade show for student organizations that wanted to recruit members. And I did that. I was a sorority rush chair. So in other words, I had a, a big background in events and um, was a very social person. And so I thought when I graduated, wow, if someone would pay me to plan events, like that's the dream job. And of course, uh, you know, I know what I know now about that. But anyway, um, a, a posting came up by this company I'd never heard of called National Instruments. And uh, they happened to be the closest business to where I lived at the time. Wow. And it was an events position. And so I thought, all right, let's, let's do that. And um, it, my first year, I planned 60 trade shows oh. just oh. in North America, 60. <laughs> I make a face because I know how hard it is. Oh yeah, trade shows are, are hard work. And we I had a user's conference that I planned as well. So that's where I cut my teeth. So I was more focused on the function of my position and the fact that it was a tech company. But um, the more I learned about how technology affects everything we do, you know, every part of our lives, the more interesting it got. So how did you become the tech company whisperer? <laughs> well, um, the further I got into my career, of course, I grew um, out of events and went into all sorts of things. So worked on in regional marketing, helping to do lead generation within different territories within the United States. I moved over to software services and managed a, a P&L for software maintenance and customer education, so a lot of those things. And then I left to start an agency with one of my colleagues at National Instruments. And um, when we were you know, baby entrepreneurs with a brand new company, we were accepting anyone that would hire us, right? Just, just pay us, we know some stuff. <laughs> and then it was about a year in that the great recession hit. And that was a very panicky time. <laughs> and it made us be introspective and say, who are the next five clients that we want to work with, that we hope hire us? And we realized that everything we knew surrounded, you know, reaching engineers and technical buyers. And so we decided to narrow the focus of our business. And when we did, our business took off. Um, sales and marketing became so much easier. Messaging about the company became easier. It just worked. I love the fact when I first met you and I heard what you do, that you are so focused in and niched into technical businesses. I was in love because that is my, the drum that I beat. I am a niching coach. I teach people how to find their super niche. I teach people how to find the gap in the market that you guys are talking about, except I, I teach them how to do that through research because they would have fired me if I just guessed at it when I worked at Pepsi, Pizza Hut, Frito-Lay, cause we launched new products every year. So how did you find your niche? Like, was it just taking everything you knew and taking a good guess, or did you actually go out and talk to people? Like, what did you do? 
Yeah, so part of it certainly was our own personal background and what we felt we were best suited to do. But the other portion was at the time, there were a lot of small to medium sized businesses that were partners with the company where we worked. And we saw how much they struggled with marketing. They didn't know the first thing about marketing. They couldn't, uh, they didn't feel like they could hire a full-time marketing person who could really build a strategy. Their websites were horrific. I mean, they were just lost. And then this time frame, you know, of early 2000s, boy, if you didn't have a solid website for your business, you were dead in the water and even more so today. And yeah. so we, we observed that market need and uh, that combined with our own experience, it just seemed like a no brainer to, to go and do this. And isn't it just to your point, so much easier when you know who you're targeting to and you're so specific about it for you to find them congregated somewhere, for you to speak their language, for you to talk about their pain, for you to come up with content just tailored for them. Isn't it just a no brainer? Absolutely. And and I think if, if I look outward to the customer that's, or the prospect thinking of hiring us, um, we speak their language. Uh, we do research reports in their industry. So we know data that impacts them directly. So we can add so much more value than a marketing generalist. And then for us on the flip side, it's so much more efficient to deliver services to this persona because we know how they think, we know what their needs are, we know what works. And it doesn't mean that it's cookie cutter. Every situation is different. Every company has their unique story that we need to extract from them. But certainly we know um, a lot that can make them successful very quickly. Yeah, because you become an expert in them. Mm -hmm. That's all you do, all you do all day, every day, you talk to these wonderful people. So let's talk more about these wonderful people. Okay. Do technical buyers behave differently than traditional B2B buyers? You know, it's so different. And I'll give you an example. Uh, if you think about yourself um, looking for, I don't know, something in Google, something you're searching on as a consumer, uh, how deep do you go and search? Uh, well, the average B2C person stops at page one. I don't know, what, what, what do you do? That It's probably true because then I wonder, like, they're too small. I'm worried about the quality of performance of, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. you think, yeah. okay, the most reliable source yeah. is probably gonna be a page one. Well, engineers are more likely to go to page 15 what? Then they 15, one five, then they are to stop at page one. <laughs> Can you believe that? Oh, I love that. I yeah. love that. I know that and, and I love that they're so different. Yeah. And it and it comes down to if you think about the technical buyer, the decisions they make in their product choices can have in some cases a life or death impact, you know, whether it's within your car, if things aren't tested appropriately or within a medical device, if things weren't, aren't working right, it could literally mean some, you know, some catastrophic consequences. And so they do a lot of research. It's important to have trusted sources and they don't, uh, they don't like to engage with sales. You know, this isn't the most social gregarious uh, group. They're suspicious of sales and marketing. And so research is paramount, digging deeper answers. And, um, and so the companies that share their knowledge and share technical details are the ones that build trust and are seen as a, a, someone that they want to work with. That's great. So, I mean, the, the technical pieces are very important in the messaging. What else are critical that most technical companies are getting wrong? Yeah, well, the big thing that they get wrong is focus too much on the technical specifications because there's this mindset of my product or my solution is so awesome that once they hear about the product, they're, oh, it's game over, you know, <laughs> and they're buying it. And it doesn't work like that, right? You still need to meet the buyer um, in their language, talk about their pain points, what they're struggling with, and show that empathy towards that buyer and then bring in the specifications. Um, but unless you have a commodity product of some sort, you really need to connect with that buyer and build your story. That's, that's key. That is so crucial. And what are some of the challenges of creating content for these guys? Well, hey, you know, it's really technical. So imagine um, acronyms that are being used and very technical terms. And if you're writing a white paper or ebook or a case study on behalf of this client, you need to get 
that you need to get your facts straight, you need to make sure those terms are used accurately. And um, it's not easy. Uh, I have this, uh, we had this interesting experience with a client, and this is a while back now, where they came to us, we were probably two years into our engagement, and they said, hey, True Marketing, we found this other company and they can write content at a fraction of what you guys charge. And they told me how much, and I said, boy, I, I can't, I can't touch that. So, okay, go give them a shot and we'll still work with you and we'll collaborate or whatever. And it took six months and they still couldn't get even one technical uh, piece of content correct. Wow. And they had to abandon the whole project. And it just goes to show, and I'm not saying we're the only ones out there that can do it. We're by no means, uh, is that the case, but you really have to have someone who's adept at writing to technical audiences and, and extracting information from a subject matter expert in order to, to get it right and uh, make it resonate with that buyer. So, I mean, I love hearing that story. Is there, could you tell me a really good Phoenix Rising success story of a like bad, scary, expensive problem that you solved for a client? Yeah, well, you know, this this isn't a, a bad one to look at when you see the the flip side of the, the results they got once we started uh, writing content on their behalf and getting traction uh, with search. But yeah, I'll tell you another one, again, related to content. Uh, so we worked with a company once that was spending, I think it was 5,000 a month on Google AdWords. And again, another engineering company. And, you know, for them, that was a lot of money. They were, I think at the time, a $15 million company. And so not inconsequential spend here. Mm -hmm. And so we made a goal with them and we said, let's displace this with organic search. And you do this through content, right? And so you need to start writing your own content and optimizing that content on your website. And let's see if we can't get away from paying because as soon as you stop paying Google, right, then, then all your results go away. So just same with stop going to trade shows. You don't have those leads anymore. And so we started this content cadence with them. And one of the very first things we asked them was, do you have any content assets laying around that are done? And one of the sales guys said, well, yeah, I, you know, I just gave, gave a presentation at a trade show and it was on a topic that was evergreen, you know, it, it wasn't going to be dated or whatever. And we said, okay, would you just record yourself presenting this, right? Yeah, open up, go to a meeting, record yourself and let's put it on your website. And we did this and first year, 120 leads. They were over the moon. That's more leads than their whole website had gotten in the past year. And, and so that was, it was a great start. And so then we kept this cadence up of every month publishing new content of all sorts on their website. And they get now where this same piece of content generates 1500 leads every single year for them. Um, it's this evergreen piece. Isn't that amazing? That, that is amazing. And, um, do you, um, have like you must have clients that work with you for life right if that's that's the case how does it work or have you had a huge influx because of covid and there's all, all sorts of new players what's happening in the well, a little bit of yes and yes so our business model is certainly to partner with companies and let's grow together over time and um, our average customer has been with us over three years so a lot of that in, in that, you know, the nature of content marketing is it's not an overnight success story, right? You get better results as time goes on and, and um, you know, your retainer looks different each year. But this year, yeah, this year has been interesting or this past year with COVID. Uh, we had a lot of companies that, yeah, yeah, content marketing, that sounds great. But, you know, my trade shows are, are giving me enough leads and I have my sales guys out there visiting people. And of course, all of that disappeared. Oh, <laughs> so we received a lot of calls from people who've been reading our blog, subscribing to our newsletter, saying, you know, this con whole content marketing thing. Yeah, I think it's time. And that we know our website's terrible. Can you please just start, um, start working with us? And so we've had to hire and, um, you know, increase our staff to keep up with this I'll call it COVID demand, but what it really is, is these companies finally understanding what digital marketing, content marketing are all about. It's amazing. I love that. So what is the one piece of advice that you would give to technical companies who are trying to get new clients, like in this pandemic? Yeah. 
Hmm. So I think you need to take a look at your messaging and the content that you're offering on your website and make sure that you're meeting the buyer where they are. And if you're not sure, then probably talking to customers, interviewing them, hearing about their pain points, why they chose your solution or why they didn't talk to some people that you didn't win and then use that information to either modify your company messaging or downstream, offer the right type of content to meet them and at their pain points where they are in their buyer's journey. The buyer's journey, I know, I know. So, I mean, what's next for true marketing? Oh, good, good question. Well, uh, we can only work with so many companies, you know, I, I, I don't want to build us into this um, massive agency. I want to stay fairly small and nimble. And so one of the things we're doing is offering educational resources to companies who are do it yourselfers or who aren't the right size or fit for true. And so some of this I did last year, I, I uh, wrote a book and published a book, started a podcast. And then this year we're offering boot camps to companies wanting to be better writers of technical content. Wow. It, you mean internally? Uh, yes, internally. Exactly. That's amazing. And because that's something you do for them, but you're teaching is like teach the teacher. Exactly. Exactly that. That's great. And um, what do you think the market's going to be like in 2021? Any different than 2020? Yes, I do think so. Um, I think companies, you know, some companies were slow to pivot during COVID. And so they lost some time there. Or if they weren't slow to pivot, you know, again, going back to this realization of my website's terrible, I need to build content. Well, gosh, that's not something that happens. <laughs> you know, it just happens, that takes a while. So I, th I think we'll see um, people embracing content marketing. I think we'll see sales visits forever changed. Mm -hmm. So less in-person sales visits, more getting on Zoom, just like we are here and seeing each other virtually face-to-face. And some of that time savings being uh, put into sales content assets and ways for sales to be more efficient as virtual um, helpers. What, what about the conference space? Do you see that ever coming back? Uh, I think it will come back eventually, but in this year, you know, what in, in our research report that we just released shows some of these findings where virtual events are confusing for people. They don't know what to expect. They're offered in all sorts of form factors. But the one thing that was most popular about industry events for technical buyers was the technical sessions. And just like that, the virtual counterpart, which is the webinar or the virtual technical conference, those things are highly valued. And so I see marketers putting their budget towards those activities that have more of a, you know, technical depth to them than having sort of this, you know, fake expo where you can get on chat or you can download content assets. They're just not taking off. The marketers I've talked to that have tried that didn't find a lot of value out of them, but they certainly did on the webinar and conference front. It's so funny that you say that because I just wrote a piece about how I used to convert so much business just by going and speaking at conferences and I've spoken at virtual conferences and it's not even comparable. Yeah. Like the, the, the conversion's not even comparable mm. and they are very clunky. Uh, you know, there's exhibitor rooms where you go and you're supposed to text them to speak to the exhibitor. And I felt sorry for those exhibitors who paid to be there. Right. Nobody was texting them. No. And, right. and, and right. It's, it feels salesy again. I don't want to, I don't know this person. I don't know this company. I'm not ready to talk to sales, but it's weird because you're fine walking around, you yeah. know, your little bag and get their tchotchkes and say, what is it that you do? And then just walk around. But to go virtually and then and then there's like the networking groups i don't know if you've been to these but you're supposed mm -hmm. to pull up a table and sit at a table like ask for permission and virtually and you don't know any of these people so and and you do that in person like you know when you have a, the meal and you're by yourself you go and you sit with people and i've sold to people that i've eaten with i've had dinner with them and like yeah. here it's not even comparable so no, i just not. thought it was interesting to ask you because you've got that's your background so it, you're, you're seeing same thing, very lukewarm, 
So I, I think that webinars, sponsored webinars, where you maybe have a, a series. So think of the companies in a technology ecosystem and that technology company, say like a Rockwell Automation might offer a you know, webinar series with different companies in each or um, a trade publication might do the same sort of virtual thing. Those to me are much more substantial opportunities because um, they deliver value, you know, in a way that that expo just falls flat. Totally agree. I am so glad to have met you, Wendy. And tell us how um, our viewers can reach you. Yeah, sure. So uh, you can visit my website at truemarketing.com and that's spelled T-R-E-W marketing.com. And you can find me on LinkedIn. And then if you'd like to subscribe to my podcast, it's called Content Marketing Engineered. And my book is by the same name. Very nice. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on today. Thank you.